Here's what we say. With faith in Jesus Christ, we receive the body of our brother, our father, our grandfather, Blair, for burial. Let us pray with confidence to God, the giver of life, that he will raise him to perfection in the company of the saints. My name is Lynn Carl, and I knew him through music and joy and hiking and good food, and the melody lingers on.
she wasn't gone. Chapter 1, beginning at the first verse. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things came into being through him, and without him not one thing came into being. What has come into being in him was life, and the life was the light of all people. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness did not overcome it. There was a man sent from God whose name was John. He came as a witness to testify to the light so that all might believe through him. He himself was not the light, but he came to testify to the light. The true light which enlightens everyone was coming into the world. He was in the world and the world came into being through him, yet the world did not know him. He came to what was his own, and his own people did not accept him, but to all who received him who believed in his name, he gave power to become children of God, who were born not of blood or of the will of the flesh or of the will of man, but of God. The word of the Lord. Lord, you now have set your servant free to go in peace as you have promised. For these eyes of mine have seen the Savior, whom you have prepared for all. If I speak in the tongues of mortals and of angels, 
but do not have love. I am the noise of God, my clanging symbol. And if I have prophetic powers, and understand all mysteries and all knowledge, and if I have all faith, so as to remove mountains, but do not have love, I am nothing. If I give away all my possessions, and if I hand over my body so that I may boast, but I do not have love, I need nothing. Love is patient. Love is kind. Love is not envious or boastful or arrogant or rude. It does not insist on its own way. It is not irritable or resentful. It does not rejoice in wrongdoing, but rejoices in the truth. It bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things. Love never ends. For now we see through a glass, darkly, but then we will see face to face. Now I know only in part, then I will know fully, even as I have been fully known. And now faith, hope, and love abide, these three, and the greatest of these is love. The word of the Lord. Now, will you put your, and can you take yours out of the envelope so it'll just be the pretty picture? Put it right in there on top. Yeah. I'm going to lay it down so it'll fit inside so we can, is that okay? <clears throat> Ooh, yours is really big, Mariah. I'm going to put it here, and I'm just going to fold it in half so that it'll fit. Blair was a wonderful presence. Um, uh, he was always very interested and, and encouraging to me. Um, and recently, uh, we had a visit with Blair, and we talked about ambition, and we talked about how people have to uh, blow their own horn in life to get to to get very far. And he quoted a wonderful section from a Gilbert and Sullivan operetta, and I was so delighted with that. Because we have some people who are... Thank you. I'm Rosalie Calabrese, and Blair and I wrote a show together called Moving On, which was done uh, upstate New York last summer. And I'll be talking about that uh, in the memories section. How was it to work with Blair? Oh, it was great fun. Really? Oh, yeah. He, he was so enthusiastic and um, well we both loved the old musicals so um, we had a lot in common that way and of course I appreciated the style that he wrote in yeah. uh, and, um, and when you had uh, difficulties when you basically had these misunderstandings or you had different opinions never <laughs> never he was so willing to um, adjust and uh, fit his music to my needs. Blair made a habit, along with his wife Patsy, of coming to our home in Washington Heights one night every week to spend time and have dinner with my wife Jean, myself, and my children. They would travel by bus, by train, every now and again, I guess by taxi, but they always came. This was a most important time for Blair, as he thoroughly enjoyed his time in our home, spending quality time with all of us. And while Wednesday night was sort of the assigned night for this to happen, because I and all of us are all too busy, Wednesday night sometimes didn't work out. But you can be sure, Blair said, nope, we're going to do it on Monday or Tuesday. He would never miss a week. It was such a pleasure to have him up to our place as, we always were as he was always there with a smile on his face, sharing important updates with us, and simply enjoying his time. What was Blair to you? We shared a, medita a meditation group. 
Hi, and what, how, how was Blair there? Oh, he was always telling stories, <laughs> charming stories. Everybody loved him. Yes, he was very, he's one of our most valuable group members. So meditation is, is not saying anything, but he told stories all the time. That's right. <laughs> For a lot of talking in our group. I didn't know that he was such a, a wonderful poet. His poetry has such life, and it's lyrical, and uh, it really moved me. And when it was sung by a soprano, wow, it was uh, awesome. Thank you. Um, first of all, I just want to thank each and every one of you for being here today. Um, it means so much to, to me and my family and me, and, and I know it means so much to Blair, and I know he's here with us. Um, I'm, I'm going to um, just say a few words of my own. I'm having a little trouble with this music stand. Can I get some technical assistance here, please, from one of my children? Um, and then I'm going to just, yeah. And then um, we have a dear friend who sent a, a poem, a friend from Chicago who, who couldn't be here. So I'll just read that also. Um, my father Blair and I always had a very close but often contentious relationship. Being the oldest, I was the first child he was parent to, so I was the recipient of all the first good and great and all the mistakes. From day one, he taught us to call him Blair when I became a teenager, our relationship predictably worsened as I rebelled against him, as all teenagers do. I went away to school, never to live at home again, aside from one brief stint in my early 20s when I was evicted from an illegal sublet. <laughs> as a rebellious teenager and self-absorbed young adult, I was not as open to Blair's wisdom and love as I now wish I had been. In his and my later years, however, our relationship deepened. Uh, we both mellowed as, we ent as he entered middle and old age and I got married and started a family. We both began to appreciate, thank you gentlemen, each other more. <laughs> Ever since I had kids, Blair loved to come to our apartment and he and my mother visited us every week. There he would make himself at home, sitting at the dining room table with his pile of papers with his list of things he wanted to talk to me about. The lists were always on small white pieces of scrap paper with his tiny cursive handwriting briefly and carefully enumerating each item, and he would check it off when we were done talking. <laughs> I'm going to share some uh, more memories and gifts that I have from Blair, starting with the mundane and veering towards the sublime. Blair's main way of loving and relating to us was to talk about himself telling stories about his life or to give advice, whether I wanted it or not. He was a consummate and passionate advice giver. <laughs> he was also passionate about making sure that his family was safe. Being the son and grandson of ear, nose, and throat doctors, he was very proactive medically. He arranged, oh, that's my next page. He arranged, that's okay for my tonsils to be removed when I was four so that I would not get tonsillitis. This is true. He arranged for my six impacted wisdom teeth to be removed when I was 16 so I wouldn't have dental problems. I had a few moles on my skin that looked suspicious in my early 20s, and a dermatologist was arranged to remove these before they became cancerous. And if any surgeon would have allowed, he would have arranged for my appendix to be removed so that I never got appendicitis. <laughs> This is true. However, no surgeon was willing to do uh, this, so I still have my appendix, which hopefully will remain calm and uninflamed. <laughs> Blair was also a huge proponent of dental care. I have, I have many very, seriously very fond memories of him showing us how to use the toothpick and the water pick and dental floss and of course regular brushing. This was like a nighttime ritual that we shared with him. The water pick was especially fun when we were kids, and we bonded around that. <laughs> we really did. I received dental cleanings and checkups um, twice a year throughout my whole childhood and, and young adulthood. Just a year ago, Blair decided to review my dental hygiene habits with me again one evening. And he reminded me to reinstate some of these daily cleaning practices that I had been neglecting. 
I was only brushing. I remember feeling a combination of slight annoyance, but mostly delight. My teeth today are strong and clean and yellow, thanks to coffee and tea, which Blair always discouraged me from drinking. Blair and my mother also gave my sister and me something deeper, structure and direction in our lives, education, love and knowledge of music, violin and piano and guitar lessons, forced childhood violin performances in front of their dinner guests, which I hated, but were in retrospect were a gift to me, although I'm not sure they were a gift to the guests. <laughs> music school, music camp, and so much more. Many hours and much money spent on these, even though we were not wealthy. Blair also gave the gift of music to my children, Max and Maya. He treated them to many of his favorite Broadway musicals. He played the piano for us during his weekly visits until he became too ill to do so. Blair supported my education throughout my education throughout graduate school. He instilled in me a lifelong love of learning. Another gift Blair gave me was a love of nature and being in nature, the spiritual and emotional gifts that hiking and just being in the natural world always bring me. Some of my happiest memories of Blair were when we were together on the hiking trails of the White Mountains of New Hampshire. I, a teenager, he in his 40s, far away from his, his stressful job and my stressful school and our cramped apartment. The openness of the mountains allowed us to have deep, heartfelt conversations that we didn't have so often at home. I also thank Blair, as well as my mother, for teaching me, about, for teaching me spirituality, which is a core of my life today. Blair's efforts got off to a rocky start. He was able to baptize me as an infant since I didn't know any better. Later on during my childhood, he attempted to teach the Bible to my sister and me. We, or at least I, had no interest and were not shy about telling him this. I remember him getting frustrated and angry. Being a parent now, I can relate. I know Blair wanted to instill in us something that was very important to him but he just didn't know how to get through to us. However, he persevered, bringing us to Sunday school throughout our childhood. He arranged for me to be confirmed in the Episcopalian Church when I was 12. Even though I did not profess any Christian faith, he wanted to make sure my soul was safely set up to go to heaven when the day came. Blair always wanted to make sure that we were safe. He really influenced me more spiritually by his example than by his conscious efforts. For years, Blair had a candle in his bathroom. He would light it every day and gaze into it, meditating. His mother, my beloved grandmother, had taught him and me this practice. When I was a teenager, Blair and my mother began to study religious and spiritual philosophers such as Gurdjieff. They did Tai Chi every day. They were getting downright groovy. <laughs> Later in life, Blair joined a wonderful mindfulness meditation group led by a dear friend and his spiritual mentor, Myra Weiss, who is with us today. By this time, I had long since been studying and practicing Buddhism, and I deeply felt the spiritual bond of our converged journeys. Several years ago in my own journey, I converted to secular humanistic Judaism. Blair was very supportive of this and very happy about it. He enjoyed his times with my congregation. Lastly, I want to say that Blair was a loving grandfather. He had cancer the entire time he was a grandparent, but he never let this stop him from loving and relating to his grandchildren. We all, as has been said, we all saw him very frequently with his devoted, our devoted visits, and he enjoyed his, his transformation, the transformation of, my, of our children from babies to who they have become today. Everyone here knows that Blair fought a 20-year battle with prostate cancer. We, to this day, do not know if it was that which got him at the end. So he may have won the battle. Blair fought this battle with grace and courage. Sorry. He never complained. He never, ever pitied himself, not once. He went to all of his doctor's appointments and complied with all the recommended treatments. He maintained a strong and stalwart presence in the face of his disease. He did not ever allow it to bring him down mentally, emotionally, or spiritually, even when he could barely walk, even when he could no longer walk, and then no longer even speak. His mind remained lucid and his spirit strong. 
He died in peace at home, surrounded by my mother, sister, and me, and our love and God's love. This is one of the greatest gifts that Blair could give to us, his example in the face of living with cancer and his brave death. I thank you, Blair, for all these gifts you have given us and for many, many more that time does not allow me to enumerate here. I am so grateful that you were and are my father. I know that God is blessing and keeping you and that you are finally freed from your suffering body. Even though I will miss you, I am so glad that you are free and that you are in a place of joy, peace, and infinite love. We will all see you there in God's time. Thank you. Thanks. I'm just going to read a poem um, by our dear friend, Yusufu Mosley, who's a longtime family friend who lives in Chicago, who couldn't be here today. Um, it's a praise poem. It's just a mo mode of verbal celebration, as Yusufu says, that it's distinctly African. Um, in Africa, praising is ubiquitous. It's a cultural institution cutting across differences and expressing a profound humanism grounded in interrelationships. It also tries to capture the essence of the person being praised. For Blair, we're going to miss hearing your voice and laughter, my friend. Unquestionably, a great loss has come to all of us. You brought a great good into the world, not only in the work you did, but more importantly, by the life you lived. We come together to share the profound personal loss to your family, relatives, and loved ones. May all that you loved be blessed with consolation, courage, and peace. For surely you have risen in radiance in the heavens and now sit in the sacred circle of the doers of good, the righteous, and the rightfully rewarded. As it is written in the sacred text of Husea, that to do that which is of value is forever. A person called forth by his work does not die, for his name is raised and remembered because of it. And so it is and will be with you, our friend, brother, husband, and father. We come together in respect and remembrance and raise up our hands and bow our heads in rightful homage to you, Blair, my friend, one whose life is a rock-strong record and a caring legacy that we will remember and practice until the sun falls from the sky and all the rivers run dry. Yes, we shall miss and mourn you, but we also rejoice in having known you, and in your rising, all you have done will endure as a monument that shall never pass away. In these moments, let us say thank you. We thank the trees that shaded you, the heavens that hovered over you, the rains that washed the earth clean for you, the world that welcomed you. We thank the friends that met you. We thank all those who came before, who laid the foundation and guided you on earth and now ask you to join them. And we thank the creator who gave you to us and who brought you to us in a good that will never go away. In closing, we say thanks, many thanks, and compared to the many times we say thanks, the grains of sand on the seashore are few. I've known Blair for years at Chapulza's Recordings and Company. He was doing terrific volunteer work while he was working full-time for RCA, and he was such fun. Dear Blair, when I first try to write some words for your funeral, my mind goes blank. Is it because of nerves? Do I have stage fright? I think it's more like I can't believe you're not there. I have no words for this. Stage fright is what I used to feel when I was little and we had to perform at those <coughs> dreaded concerts at Town Hall. I distinctly remember the time you and I performed there together. I was about seven, and it was a piece for four hands on the piano. I looked over to my left, and to my shock, your hands were shaking. What? My father is as nervous as I am? How can that be? You always seem so sure of yourself, and you always reassured me that I'd do fine in a performance, in school, in life. This startling glimpse of your humanness was as unsettling as it was reassuring. As it turns out, my final memories of you are equally unnerving revelations 
of your human fallibility. The last time I look into your eyes, on Tuesday, February 11th, they are wide with fear, panicked by your sudden lack of breath. Now it's my turn to reassure and comfort, to help you down the path that no one, least of all you, wanted you to go down. Now I must soothe you while you soothe you while I'm fighting against my own panic, just as you reassured and accompanied me all those years ago on the piano with your own shaking hands. I tell you I believe in you, the same way you always believed in me, in my ability to get where I needed to go. I remind you of your capacity, which I always admired, to rise to the occasion, even when the occasion is shocking or not at all how you planned for things to go. You and I both need that kind of reassurance, Blair, because if truth be told, we are both a couple of control freaks. <laughs> but like good Scorpios, the phoenix rises from the ashes. Your human frailty played out against your physical vitality, your stubbornly independent nature, your strong opinions, your wonderful storytelling, and your remarkable ability to discipline yourself. I wish I possessed half your self-discipline, Blair. Somehow I think we all envied you this. You were out walking or swimming while the rest of us helped ourselves to another slice of cake and a nap. You seemed in a way like someone who would live forever, just as your hundred-year-old mother and your many alpine rock-climbing ancestors. Watching the photos of you as a child, I'm moved to share the email that we received the other night from your former classmate, the author Elizabeth Marshall Thomas. She couldn't make it here today, but she wrote these words. From our days at Shady Hill School, I remember Blair as an energetic, smart, successful child who had enviable calmness and presence in the face of difficult situations. Even the meanest teacher didn't face him. He just stayed his composed, quiet, modest, confident self, perhaps even smiling slightly, politely, while listening to the teacher's rants. These remarks and the photos of the young you, Blair, knowing you endured not only the rants of teachers but also the ones at home, open up a deep well of love, empathy, and sorrow inside me. As a daughter and as a mother, I know how it feels to be deeply upset, to feel enraged, just as I know what it is to be the object of these emotions. We both know all sides of this subject. Like all the parents and children in history, Blair, we are so humanly lame. I just hope that where you are now, that you've forgiven yourself your flaws, because you were your own worst critic. For some, the mention of strong emotions might come as a surprise. Like your classmate writes, you always seemed so unruffled and composed. But you had very distinct public and private selves. The wall dividing these selves started literally at our apartment door, which had to be closed before anybody could speak, and we shouldn't make noise in the hallway. The sanctity of the realm behind it is the story of an introvert, a Scorpio, you, Blair, needed the space, the peace, and the calm it provided. God, how I understand, I need these things myself. Your private self was dignified and boundaried. Your trustworthiness and loyalty to others could be counted on to the bitter end. That apartment was also filled with music. <clears throat> My evening bath times were permeated by the sounds of Jean practicing the Bach double on her violin while you accompanied her on the piano. And there were all our own various practicing sessions, in addition to which was that incessant opera that I never did learn to love, although I must say that I, when I just heard the aria in the church, I recognized it, and I loved it, probably because I heard it growing up. The soothing classical radio station, your music, the musicals you loved, it was so rich, I only wish you had shared more of your own music with us, because I always loved everything I heard. The 70s rock and roll we eventually began to bring in did not rub off on you, 
any more than those awful sounding bands you represented with the RCA Music Club, Record Club. We were delighted to receive countless free records, along with your colorful stories of the rock star's excesses and egos. After we flew the coop and left that inner sanctum to make our lives elsewhere, we returned for your stories, your political analyses, your loving interest in our lives, and the hilarious sense of irony that our family has always shared. Where will we be without your humor and your stories, Blair? Bereft I am, but I also feel intensely grateful for the 49 years of knowing you. Even when we had to battle some things out, being equally matched in our stubborn and opinionated natures, I recognized that your intensity was based in caring, and you had more integrity than practically anyone I have ever met. Thank you for inspiring me with your example and for showing me how it's possible to combine devotion for your children with a deep respect for them as individuals. And I have not lost you completely, Blair. For one thing, your custom-tailored winter flannel pajamas happen to fit me perfectly, as I discovered last week. <laughs> Nor do we lose you to your fear in the end. This too passes on February 11th. February 12th, your body responds to the ministrations of my mother and sister and I, who band together to care for you, the three loving musketeers. We watch you struggle, but we also watch you make peace. You've risen to the occasion. You're the phoenix. Most of all, your love for me and my love for you and for us are very much alive inside me. Thank you. Okay, yes. Thank you. And I have something, my, my family is going to do something now. Um, <clears throat> uh, my son Vince, Vince, where are you? Vince and Vincent and Mariah, please go to the piano. Are they there? Um, Vince it took some piano lessons and he learned to play this song. Does anybody know where Vince is? Oh. Oh, maybe somebody could go get Vince. Um, typical. Uh, about two years ago, we first we heard Vince play this song for his piano lesson, it's, and, and he sounded like an angel. And Blair saw the video of it, and he loved it. And when I saw Blair in these last two weeks, um, lying there, it's so fragile and frail, this song uh, came to my mind. It's, I'll translate it now for you because it's a Dutch song. Do we not know where Vince is? Okay. It's very simple text. It's called The Water Lily. The text reads, floating on the water, so fragile and so lovely, beautiful water lily, so tender and elegant. Jean told me that in Buddhist teachings, the water lily represents the passage to the afterlife, so then I felt even more like we must play this song. very remarkable, funny, smart, very attentive. And he and Patsy together were so, it was an enviable relationship. Uh, that's what I thought. Did you tell your husband that? And I knew it wasn't always easy. It never is, you know. 
uh, and I knew how much he loved his family, you know. And even at the very end, I, I visited when he was in the hospital and also when he came home in hospice care. He had that little twinkle of humor still came out of him, you know. He became one, very, very warm friends. And really, I felt Blair as a brother. He would come, we spent eight years in Mexico, Blair came down to visit us, climbed Mount Popo Catapetal, then we moved to Washington. Uh, Blair came often to our house and stayed with us and uh, constantly sent us articles. And uh, when we were in Mexico, cut them out of the New York Times. And uh, when I would come to New York from Washington to do work, I was always welcome at, with Blair and Patsy, who was both very loving hosts. So uh, we are going to miss Blair very much. Um, but I'd like to read um, what my son Max has just sent by email. He says, I'm sorry I'm not there, but my three-year-old daughter gave me another one of her illnesses. My Uncle Blair was a wonderful fellow. There was no artifice or phoniness about him. In a world of phonies in the music industry, Blair had no patience. By the way, Blair and I wrote two songs together, one of which uh, actually won a prize. Are you gonna say? Um, visiting his office at RCA years ago, my mother and I asked him why he had no chairs or sofa for visitors. He replied that without furniture, his fellow music industry employees would not be able to linger in his office. <laughs> With friends and family, Blair was exactly what he presented himself, which was a sociable, kind, and thoughtful person with a great love for physical fitness and music. I am especially appreciative of the wonderful and loving relationship he had with my mother, particularly in the last 25 years when he would visit. It meant a great deal to her. They're on the phone together all the time. Hi, everybody. Uh, the first thing I'm going to read, actually, is from Annie Maccabee, who is Sandy Lee and Michael's daughter, Izette's uh, sister. And she lives in London, so she couldn't be here. But she wrote something, which I read. Blair was one of the figures in our family who always, uh, who always urged a creative route, however tough, who liked to mentor the young, help usher us into adulthood, who bucked us up when we were low and always had tips on how to navigate yet another hurdle. It didn't surprise us at all that he mentored young composers in New York and founded a record company for them. We knew he had huge faith in all creative work on his side of the family. Jane's violin, Katie Lee's painting, Patsy's singing, and ours, urging on our mother in her portrait painting, in her novel, which she published. He and our mother talked on the phone almost every day, thoughtfully sending each other cartoons and clippings. Blair enthused our father's books, Izette's paintings and Nora's screenplays, and our brother Max's legal work and real job. <laughs> we all noticed growing up that Blair was very disciplined in his own creative life. He ate his oatmeal every day, he played his scales, he swam his laps, but he always supported the talent around him. When our grandmother, my great-grandmother, got sick, he recorded her songs with a soprano in New York and handed her the tape, which she wrapped in tinfoil and promptly gave to her handsome doctors, ensuring her speedy recovery. I guess briefly before we move on, I'm going to tell a couple of stories. I think everyone here more or less knows that Blair communicated a lot through his stories. Uh, he, had a, he had a really incredible sense of humor. Um, I think that hasn't been mentioned. And so I thought I would share some of the stories he told me um, over... And then the, the final story I want to tell, th th this one just came to mind when Michael mentioned Blair's going to Mexico to visit them, is when he climbed the mountain... How, how is it pronounced? Popocata pedal? So he climbed the mountain. Blair, as you know, was a huge mountaineer. And he went to, uh, to Mexico, I, you know, in the 1970s, I guess, and he did, in the 1960s, and he went to climb Mount uh, Popocata pedal. And he climbed the mountain, it's a very tall mountain, so he had to bring an ice axe with him. Um, and unfortunately, he went up the mountain with, a, with an aide, 
with an assistant. He climbed the mountain successfully, came back down, and he still had his ice axe with him. And they lived, I, I guess, in Mexico City, and he had to get back to their home. But he was carrying an ice axe with him, and there was not a single taxi that was willing to pick him up. Um, because this was a man who didn't speak a word of Spanish on the side of a street with an ice axe. Um, and eventually, I think the story goes that Blair, again, who did not speak a word of Spanish, somehow managed to get home to their home on public transportation. And according to the version of the story that I've heard, he got home and I guess Sandy Lee and Michael were absolutely shocked that anyone would ever take the public buses, but somehow he was successful. And
Oh, oh, Pretty oh. hard, huh, babies? Yes. Yes. Pretty hard, huh, babies? Yes. This yes. is your grand. This is bear. Uh, I'm very busy with activities, including a lot of exercise, mostly in the mornings, the swimming three times a week, and so on. Uh, lots of walking. Uh, and I have, uh, am trying to do more and more with my music. And uh, that, of course, is there's just an oh, endless amount of work to do with that. Little sneeze. That's yes. You're just a cutie pie. Aw, oh, darling. You're just a little cutie pie. I'm personally rooting for Obama, uh, who I think has really excellent leadership qualities and who's got a very firm idea of what he wants to do. Uh, I think it's going to be d uh, difficult for him to win because. McCain is a more known entity, and uh, uh, I don't think McCain will be a very good president. He's got a lot of, of uh, anger in him. He tends to fly off the handle. Uh, he uh, is unpredictable, uh, and he's moved his position from being a fairly moderate Republican to being quite a conservative Republican. Oh, oh. <laughs> Aren't you happy that you don't have to do that anymore, Blair? <laughs> oh, dear. There comes a time when you... Music. So, uh, the first musical was uh, when I was at Harvard. Uh, <clears throat> for the Hasty Pudding, I wrote a musical. Then... Uh, uh, About what? Uh, oh, it was called uh, Strike While It's Hot. And I don't remember the theme of it, except that it was very funny. And then uh, I wrote a musical based on the life of Casanova with, with uh, somebody in the late 60s. Unfortunately, the libretto for that was very weak, but he wrote, he and I wrote wonderful songs. His lyrics were marvelous. And so I have that on a CD, and um, that you'll get that. And uh, then the next show I wrote was based on a Georges Fado play, and uh, I wrote that with Eben Keys uh, about 1979 and 1980. And that was done in, summer, done in summer stock up in Fitchburg, Massachusetts. They performed it. And uh, I have a very nice recording of that. Uh, then after so many ladies... What year was that? About 1979 or 1980. About 1980. Okay. Uh, and then during the 80s, I don't remember exactly what year, but the mid-80s, uh, Eben Keys and I wrote two uh, reviews, R-E-V-U-E-S, reviews, for the Amateur Comedy Club. And they got done in a lot of other clubs as well, uh, that is, membership clubs. And uh, we had a lot of fun with them. The Yale Club, uh, we, we invited us to come and perform there. Uh, the Princeton Club invited us to come and perform there. Uh, and there were some other clubs. I don't even remember where they were. And finally, we went into a commercial nightclub and did the show. And uh, we did an amalgam of, of the two reviews for these different places. But anyway, so I wrote these two reviews for the Amateur Comedy Club. They were quite successful. Then, um, during that, somewhere in there, uh, I, I had met a Hollywood screenwriter, very well known. He was quite elderly when I knew him, named Joseph Schrank, who had written films for Ethel Waters and other well-known uh, uh, movie stars. He also had written the uh, television script for Rodgers and Hammerstein's Cinderella in the early 1950s. Anyway, he had a, a, a spoof of a fairy tale, which was hilariously funny, and a, something that would appeal to both young people as well as adults. And uh, I set that to music, and we call it Dragons Everywhere. That's never been performed, but it's, it's a sung through show, meaning that there's no spoken dialogue in it, everything is sung. So I have CDs of that, and that'll be in your album as well. Uh, and. Uh, that I hope someday to, I would love to see that get produced. I have to turn the page.